Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Crash and Ride podcast. It feels like months since I've said those words. Oh my God, so much has happened. Uh, this week's guest is Ryan Monahan. Ryan is a guitar player and bass player and composer, uh, music director. He's a really outstanding musician. He and I have played in Easter Island together, a band that we toured heavily in a couple of years ago. And um, that band goes on uh, with a different drummer now, uh, a really great drummer, and that band is really good. Ryan is a really outstanding musician, but he's also someone who has survived um, a, a, just a broken thyroid and um, and some a lot of childhood trauma, and he's had quite an amazing story. We get into that in the interview. But first, I want to talk about the crazy world we're living in right now. Um, the last time I released an episode, um, a week later, I played with the band Motherfucker at the Earl. It was one of the great shows of my life. I had such a good time. Uh, I learned all their songs and um, subbed for my friend Erica Rickson, who couldn't do the show. And then I had five, eight shows the next two nights, and then South by Southwest was canceled. And, man... The world is changing uh, so rapidly that I can barely kind of hang on right now. Um, like you, probably, we are locked in. We haven't had anyone in or out of the house now in four or five days. It's been a week since we started rationing or started um, just kind of putting food aside expecting to be here originally for two weeks. And then the CDC said plan for eight weeks, had to go back out of the grocery store bought a lot of rice, a lot of beans, a lot of canned goods. Um, how's everybody doing? We're doing okay. It's every now and then one of us has like an anxiety spike and, uh, <laughs> it gets really uncomfortable. Um, my daughter just turned 10 years old, had to celebrate her birthday with no friends other than her mom and dad. Yeah, man. Um, Anxious times. This interview happened before any of this stuff started happening. And it feels like a, a weird little postcard from a golden age before we had to worry about um, diseases uh, killing our parents and grandparents. And um, it's it was nice to edit it today. I finally, I've been so sort of frantic. I've been running around real anxious. Um, and... Uh, just trying to make sure we have everything we need and um i finally got to sit down and, and revisit my job this podcast and it was like oh yeah man, remember this interview this was like two and a half weeks ago and just a different world it's a different world then also since i recorded this interview i got the incredibly unfortunate news that my friend jake had killed himself jake nelson lived in chicago he was a young guy and sweet guy and he would call me at one or two or three o'clock in the morning he was a listener to the show we have a lot of friends in common and he's been struggling for a long time and he would call me and we would sometimes talk until the sun came up and I talked about him once or twice on the show but I wanted to do a memorial episode. I, I, I called different people that knew Jake and we talked and I had some recordings. There were some people also I wanted to talk to who just had trouble making themselves available for whatever reason. And I feel like grief is such a private thing and a personal thing that I didn't want to press the issue and sort of force people to talk to me. So, <clears throat> so I have it. And it doesn't mean that we love Jake any less or that his memory isn't precious to us. It just means that some people aren't ready to to talk about it, and that's okay. But just one of us lost his battle with sadness, and and I'll miss him forever. If this is your first episode of Crash and Ride, <laughs> welcome. Crash and Ride is a long-form interview podcast where I talk to musicians who survived anxiety, depression, and addiction, and abuse, and trauma. And I had hoped 
that by sitting down with people who were similarly afflicted to myself and, and the people closest to me, other musicians who I love and care about, that we could start a, a dialogue and have a conversation where we, we have a common vocabulary about the things that make us sad, make us anxious, make us afraid, and we could start to heal together. And I know it's helped some people. It was really hard for me to lose Jake. And there was a moment there where I thought, why? Why am I pretending to know anything about mental health? Am I putting people at risk? Because when Jake would call me, I wouldn't have all the answers, you know. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm a drummer uh, with a mental health podcast. And I felt like a fucking fraud for a minute. And I'm not completely over that. It, it's... Man, it's, it's, these are fucking tough times. Um, but I have been in touch with a lot of people who I trust and care about, and we're talking and we're kind of looking out for each other. And, and um, I got my family around me in, in our little farmhouse in the country. And Well, we're all in it now, aren't we? I don't really have any choice but to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, I talked to Nick Greer today. Nick is one of the sponsors of the show and I'm going to read an announcement about Nick Greer's pedals in a second but Nick is going to work every day because that's what Nick does um, it's the way that he quiets his anxiety about the world situation and I'm super proud to know Nick and I'm proud to play his guitar pedals when I play guitar and just know that even even folks like Nick are like Man, what the fuck? What what happens now? So many musicians I know right now are sitting in their rooms in Nashville or New York or here in Athens or in Atlanta. Like, how the fuck am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to pay my rent? Like, we're all grounded right now. I lost a couple thousand bucks just these for these two weeks. I had shows in, in Austin at South by Southwest. I had shows um, here that we were going to play instead, and then those got canceled too. Um Pinky Doodle Poodle got all the way over here from Japan with their new visa. They have 18 months before they have to renew, and now they can't play. <laughs> they have so much debt from paying for the visa. Um, if you're a music fan and you have any disposable income at all, now would be a great time to buy a T-shirt. Lee Baines and the Glory Fires, probably my favorite rock band in the world, finally got their online merch store up. I'm putting Pinky Doodle Hoodle merchandise on the Crash and Ride page sometime this week. I have less time to do stuff than I expected. It's weird. Like, I thought that with all this time at home, I'd be really able to focus on the podcast and focus on, um, you know, helping Pinky Doodle Poodle and getting ready for when this Iron Curtain goes back up again. But, man, with my kid home, uh, I'm now a homeschool teacher. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. So bad at homeschool teaching. But, um... Yeah, I guess we're all just doing our best, and um, my kid included. God love her. Um, saddest thing in the world, watching her eat birthday cake alone by herself tonight, man. Broke my fucking heart. Anyway, keep an eye out for Pinky Doodle Poodle t-shirts. Uh, the flyers from the show that got canceled at the Nowhere Bar are on eBay. Um, you can find links to those on my social media. I'll also put a link in the show notes. And uh, keep an eye out for um, all the other bands that you love, trying to find other ways to not go under, because these are lean times for a lot of musicians. Okay, Crash and Ride is brought to you in part by Greer Amplification. Greer Amps builds the best boutique effects pedals available. If you're looking for an overdrive, boost, fuzz, compressor, or tremolo that is rugged, road-tested, and at home, on stage, in the studio, or in your living room, Greer has a pedal for you. Nick and his staff strive to build the best products around with the best tone you've ever heard. They believe in their products, and they stand behind them, too, backing each one up with a lifetime warranty to the original owner. Each Greer Amps product is hand-built in Athens, Georgia, USA. Go to www.greer.com. Com. or one day you can visit your favorite music retailer again <laughs> man it's crazy right now um, i think greer is still shipping um you know uh, another sponsor of crash and ride is jittery joe's and they make an espresso blend and i can still get cans of that and probably get them to the post office for now um, athens georgia is under a 24 7 curfew for now 
but I think that it's um, mostly a voluntary curfew. They're just trying to keep people out of bars and restaurants where they can transmit the disease. So if I have a legitimate thing, I'm, I'm going to the roaster to pick up cans and then I'm going to the post office and then I'm going home. Probably won't be a problem. So go to the Crash and Ride website at crashandridepodcast.com. You can get T-shirts. You can get cans of espresso there. And, um, you know, it'll help us keep going. I've got some people scheduled to do interviews this week. Um, going to talk to my friend Maurice in Pittsburgh. He's a composer and guitar player, outstanding musician. Uh, Fez Razi, who I interviewed in episode four, is going to interview me for the April 1st edition, the April Fools. Last year we did April Fools with him, and it was the uh, imposter syndrome episode. Um, I think we're right at the one-year mark. Um, I wanted to do a one year of crash and ride episode. Um, and I was getting all reflective about that. And then South by Southwest got canceled. Jake killed himself and the coronavirus caused me to lose every gig I had all at once. And I'm just now sort of slowly ratcheting down from full on panic mode. So that's coming. Um, it won't be as timely as I'd hoped. Um, it has been almost a year, exactly a year. It's been an amazing year. Um, I have a lot of gratitude and I have a lot of thanks to give uh, to everyone who's done an interview and everyone who's listened and everyone who's contributed. And I mean, you guys are great. Uh, I understand if you're in a position where you have to pull out of your Patreon commitment, um, I'm going to be okay for now. Um, we have a little savings and, um, and you know, because I've been a musician my entire adult life, we keep our overhead kind of low. So I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to be all right. Um, there are a lot of musicians I know out there who are just walking a knife's edge right now. So, you know, I understand. I understand. Um, I'm doing a quarantine cooking with Crash and Ride uh, YouTube thing. The YouTube channel is up, by the way. That's one thing to celebrate. Uh, every episode we've ever recorded is now available on YouTube. If you're listening at home and don't want to mess with your, um, you know, whatever podcast app you're using you can always just listen on youtube now but i'm also going to do some video um there's one that's being worked on right now on how to make bread out of flour and yeast if you got them at home like a bunch of us grabbed supplies and we were like i'll probably need flour and we grabbed five ten pounds of flour i can show you how to make bread with that I even if you don't have yeast i'm going to do a sourdough episode uh, i'm going to do a navajo fry bread episode if you've got dry beans in the house uh, i'm going to show you how to make really delicious beans out of dried beans just and, you know, eventually, hopefully, these will just sort of recede into history as, oh, yeah, these are great sort of punk rock house uh, food tips, how to feed a whole bunch of people really cheap once this whole coronavirus thing blows over. But for now, like, this is how you can stay alive. If you have to run out and grab dry beans, grab them. By the time you get home with them, I should have a video up on how to make them delicious. So um, keep an eye out for that. This week's interview, Ryan Monahan. Just a really brilliant, sweet, talented guy with just a fuck ton of integrity. Someone I've worked with and would work with again at the drop of a hat. Uh, we have a lot of fun together. Uh, I don't think I've ever laughed as much as I did on tour with Ryan and the rest of the guys in Easter Island. In the interview, we talk about his before and after of what he looked like before he got his uh, Hashimoto's disease diagnosis and after. And the transformation is unbelievable. And there'll be a picture of that in the show notes. If you're listening on a podcast app that doesn't do show notes, you can always go to the Patreon page and see that picture. Um, there's going to be some links to the uh, GoFundMe for the uh, or Kickstarter. Now, I can't remember which one it is. But anyway, the, the Easter Island guys are about to put out the record on vinyl that they've been working on for six whole years. Um, so you can go check that out uh, in the show notes, too. So, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's have a normal hour and a half talk uh, without talking about a virus at all. Let's talk to Ryan Monahan. All right, I'm here with Ryan Monahan, guitar player, bass player, composer, um, film scorer, and um, music director for several um, pretty high-profile projects. You worked with Cindy Wilson's um, post-B52 solo career, and um, 
You've also uh, sort of become musical director and producer for the band Easter Island and a million other things. So welcome. Thanks for having me on, Patrick. Uh, really appreciate it and good to, to connect with you on this platform here. I mean, yeah, we have known each other now for <laughs> I mean, it's close to a decade, I guess. We've been doing stuff together for a while now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I would say yeah, probably around 2009 or 10 is probably when we first started playing music together. Yeah, so one of the sort of recurring themes of the podcast outside of its sort of central mission of being about mental health and 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 getting better is that I I interview these people who have these like enormous amount of professional accomplishments and it's not always reflected in their level of um, sort of material success but like in this case it's really an extraordinarily inverse ratio like you have done so much stuff of such high quality that it's uh, it's really remarkable thanks thanks man that's like so kind of you to say well I mean your background isn't just I played in rock and roll bands in bars like you went to conservatory and stuff like you're 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 fundamentally rooted in a very strong theoretical background too yeah, you're actually maybe one of the few people that know that. <laughs> so I, I, you know, rarely have had the opportunity to to exercise those chops. To be honest, aside from maybe the aspect of, you know, arranging or you know, when I am working with, you know, when I had worked with Cindy or even now working with Easter Island, uh, I still very much think, you know, compositionally and and uh, I, I think like an arranger. But yeah, to your point. I did attend the Hart School of Music Conservatory in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, and then I ended up graduating from Central Connecticut University, which has an equally amazing uh, music program. But more formally, you know, I grew up playing in orchestras, and one of my first instruments was the upright bass. So I learned how to read music in in bass clef, and. That was kind of like my launching off point, but I had I had maintained that throughout uh, middle school, high school, and college, playing in orchestras, and then that kind of expanded outward into uh, playing in jazz ensembles and that sort of thing. So, I I would say my background is, was pretty split between a classical background and a jazz background, and and all during that time, you know, I was either taking uh, upright bass jazz lessons or, you know, I was taking classical lessons on guitar. And so, uh, I, you know, I feel like that s still comes through, even though everything I've been working on for basically the past decade has been, you know, pop music. Um, but, you know, I, I still, you know, try to work that kind of uh, knowledge in whenever I can. <laughs> it's funny if you, if you, if you sort of take the helicopter view of that, that, that set of accomplishments, you could very easily get the idea that you had this sort of uh, country club uh, pre Ivy League upbringing with a swimming pool. But um, because I know you personally, I know that wasn't actually the case. Yeah. So I the truth is that I, I busted my ass off to I, I was the first person in my uh, immediate family to graduate from with a bachelor's degree. And yeah, definitely didn't come from a, a privileged upbringing by any means. Al although I will say, you know, my parents were supportive of me uh, being a musician, but but for the most part, I had to pay my way uh, through college, which which I did by gigging heavily and working on nights and weekends. And uh, thankfully, you know, uh, having worked really really hard in high school, I I. Uh, received a number of scholarships, which paid for the majority of my education. So yeah, were it not for that, I wouldn't have had to have this, uh, this amazing experience, uh, getting to, you know, learn music theory and music history and be a part of these really, uh, strong music programs that I got to be a part of in, in my college experience. Yeah. I, I want to drill down into that a lot more, but I think that it's, I've never seen a clearer case of someone who came from a fairly disrupted early life who for whom music was this like salvation i don't i don't feel like it's, it's it's overstating the case to say that music literally saved your life yeah i mean i mean absolutely i mean i i would say that it's you know it's accurate to say my childhood was was not maybe a normal one and you know, I, I did move around a lot, was kind of shuffled around a lot, um, and, and did up, end up moving back and forth between Connecticut and Georgia uh, more than once, and attended three different high schools. And, 
that just that in itself, you know, caused me to just think differently, you know, to kind of, uh, because I didn't have a set group of friends per se, it really, it really sort of put me in a mental space where I felt like I was always kind of observing things from the outside and, and never really wanted to get too close to anybody because I just felt like that was just the normal state of things, you know, not because it was like this woe is me kind of uh, state of mind or anything. It was just like, okay, like the nature of reality is, is fleeting, right? Like I, you know, like I never had the experience of like, you know, having this continuity of like, you know, growing up in this like consistent uh, environment. So I feel like as a result of that, that really caused me to turn inward and really turn towards music as a constant, um, as something that was really reliable for me. And so, you yeah. know, by the time I was in high school, uh, I, you know, I would, I would basically come home from school, finish up my homework and then, you know, practice pretty much until bed, like maybe six hours a day. Yeah. Um, and at that point I was all self-taught. Uh, I was really just popping records on like, you know, I remember sitting down with like, you know, band of gypsies records like Jimi Hendrix. And oh, man. I didn't know that was a. <laughs> A fundamental text for you, but Band of Gypsies is maybe my favorite album of all time. Oh my God, same. And, really? And, and I had so, no idea. We've known each other a decade, <laughs> and this never came up. How did this never come up? Oh yeah, I know. I, it's weird. I I don't know why. I never bring it up. You wouldn't even like hear a trace of that, like in any of the music that I work on. Even like I feel like so. Um, yeah, but uh, there's just the rawness of it. Just the. Uh, uh, God, it's just it's just that that uh, that record, that live record of the band of gypsies has pores, man. Like there, there's just a lot of depth to it. Well, you know, I have lots, all lots of the rehearsal tapes from that yeah. for that show somewhere. Wow. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I got them from this guy who was selling them. Um, he had a table in the East Village. I was on tour and like he was like a bootlegger guy. And he just like had a spot on the sidewalk and he had like bricks of cassettes like rubber banded together uh, of all these different shows a lot of dead stuff which I mean who cares um, sorry deadheads but <laughs> Jesus Christ but um, but also like all of the rehearsals for those shows at Fillmore East were recorded and he had like a brick of five cassettes rubber banded together that said Band of Gypsies rehearsal tapes and I was just like take my money and, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, I, I eventually ripped those. And if I can find my old iPod and it will still charge up, I could probably use Rockbox to download all that material and make it available to you or, or anybody who's interested, because, you know, it's it's going to be bootleg anyway. But um, yes, please. And that was good stuff. I really love that band of gypsies recording. Um, Patrick, you may also not know this, but my first electric guitar was a white on white Squire Stratocaster. Because I, I wanted a guitar that just like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> I had no idea. I, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. And I, I would love just sitting down with those albums and trying to just, you know, even if it was listening to like a five or ten second segment at a time, just like, you know, transcribing it. Um, and, uh, you know, trying even to mimic the vocabulary of like the, you know, the his style too, you know. I nearly gave myself tendonitis trying to play bar chords like he did with the thumb wrapped over the top of the fretboard a few weeks ago. <laughs> like, and gosh, was, yeah, it's so funny we're talking about this because now that I think about it, I, I have I've never really given this a passing thought. But I played I, to this day. That's how I play bar chords. Really, and it's because I learned that from Jimi Hendrix, and I, I still, you know, some twenty years later or whatever. Uh, I, I still play bar chords uh, that way. I don't think my hands are quite big enough for the kind of big chunky Gibson neck that I often play on my hollow body. Um, to I have a giant mutant hands. <laughs> 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 I really do. Um, that's crazy. I, I, I had no idea. We should get together and play those songs sometimes. Uh, yes. One of my totally. favorite things from that band of gypsies recordings is, is there's a point where I think it's between the first tune and machine gun, the second tune on the vinyl LP that I have of it, um, where 
Jimmy finishes this insane guitar solo. They they go through the head, they end the song, and then he checks his tuning really quick, and he's so far out of tune. <laughs> you know, it's like, gonk, 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 and it's like, how did he play that solo on a guitar that is that profoundly out of tune? And it's just that his ear was so good, and he was bending so much of the notes into pitch that, like... That's right. Yeah, he would bend like crazy, and, you know, and, and as a stylistic feature of his playing, he would bend notes like two or more whole steps at a time. Well, he was playing eights, apparently. Like, his strings were eight gauge. Really? I did not know that. I did he not played know really light strings. I, I worked with this producer years ago named Rick Beato, and now he's got this YouTube channel that's uh, thousands of people watch. And uh, I, I like Rick, and I think he's got a lot of really strongly held opinions, most of which are right. But he has some um, received knowledge about drums and drum tuning, and 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 that I would like to sit down and go, Rick, buddy, you're so close here, but you got to go this one extra step. But he was talking about string gauge, and in the 70s, everybody played eights or nines or nine and a halves. Um, and they did a like side by side shootout with 11s, 10s, nines, and eights. And it was interesting to see where the heavier gauge strings sat in the mix. And I started thinking about what happens when I mix guitars. And one of the first things I do is carve out some of that low mid woof that yes. comes from 11s. Like everyone plays 11s or even 12s now because, you know. Stevie Ray Vaughan effect, but um, apparently all those 70s guys, Billy Gibbons, Jimi Hendrix, they all played really light gauge strings for that extra bit of kind of slinkiness. And I guess uh, I just saw an ad yesterday that Ernie Ball is now doing nine and a half again. So there you go. Nine and a half. I didn't even know that existed. 9.5s. All right. But, um, well, I'm a 10 guy. I always have been. Yeah, I get it. You mm -hmm. know, I like all yeah. my guitars are strung with 10s now. Yeah. But, um, it's interesting to know that, like, if Hendrix was playing eights or even nines, like those those two and a half step bends become a little less like. How is that even possible? Oh, it's possible because the strings are pretty slinky. Yeah, that right. If he was playing eights, then yeah, I could see how malleable the strings would be. Yeah, um, your childhood was. You guys are pretty. It was there was a lot of economic precarity. Whew. Yeah. Your folks split up when you were like four, is that right? Yeah, I, I think it, I was four, probably three or four uh, yeah. At the time. Yeah. And that, at, at the time, we were still living in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so it was, um, it was a bit later on. I, I think I was around 10 when my father uh, remarried and, and moved down to Georgia, which was eventually how I ended up moving down there. Yeah. But you know, my mother was a, you know, a single mom for, for most of my childhood. And there was three of us, there was three boys. Um, so it was just her, um, uh, on a teacher's assistant salary, which if, if I recall correctly, was, was maybe 18 to 20,000 a year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, just that, you know, just her. And of course there was, you know, child support. Um, but it was just, you know, just the three of us boys and my mom, like, you know, and, uh, as a result, you know, I, I, she did the best she could, but at the same time, the rent was often late and utilities were often late. And that meant that we were, we kind of lived like out of suitcases, um, more, yeah. or less, you know, like I just, just like when I think back to being a kid, I just. I just have images of boxes. I just, I always think of that images of boxes uh, because it was rare that we would live in any one place for more than a year. So, um, yeah, it was just like, I, I, I've counted at least 12 or 13 different places that we lived. And you were the oldest, right? I was uh, the youngest, actually. Oh, the youngest. Yeah. So when my dad remarried, he had two children. And so I have two younger siblings that are half siblings on my dad's side. Oh, see. so like okay. technically I'm a one of five, but I only have one full brother. Right. And uh, my oldest brother has a different father, so he's also a half brother. So you were adultified pretty young, though. So I recall from the stories you've told me that you ended up with a lot of responsibilities that were pretty heavy for just like a little kid. 
Yeah. So, and a lot of that had to do with my mom working uh, two or three jobs at any given time. So I remember there was a long stretch where she was a teacher's assistant in the in the New Haven public school system, by the way, which was like dangerous minds, like just r- really brutal, which we can come back to if you want. Um, and but at at night, you know, as, or as soon as she got home, or sometimes she wouldn't even be able to come home because she'd have to go right to working a restaurant shift. So she would also be, uh, there was a, a long stretch of time where she was a waitress at, at the diner in town. <clears throat> or uh, if it wasn't the diner, she would be working for various different like catering companies. Um, so she was often working two or three jobs. Um, and there were a lot of times where we didn't see her. Um, except, you know, later at night or first thing in the morning before school. <clears throat> so my brother and I, you know, very, you know, we would just kind of come home and, uh, it was just kind of like a couple wild animals beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of really, like I, I have this one memory of uh, man, I would get furious with him. And I have this one memory of shoving him into, you know, those old televisions that used to be like embedded in a piece of wooden furniture. Sure. Co- uh, console television. A console television. Yeah. So we used to have one of those in, in the 90s. And I pushed him, like shoved him straight into that thing. And behind it was this enormous uh, painting of a, like a landscape or something. I don't even remember what it was of. And and because those console televisions had all these, you know, mechanical parts sticking out the back, it it uh, the the TV kind of jutted uh, into that painting and ripped a giant hole <laughs> into that painting. <laughs> and uh, I just remember us both. Uh, well, that was, you know, admittedly my fault, but we had to tell our mom when she came home. And I don't remember her being, um, I thought she was going to be a lot more uh, pissed off about it than she was, but may- maybe it was something she got at a tag sale or something, who knows? Yeah. But but yeah. The, the, the point is that, you know, it was just kind of like us fending for ourselves and, you know, making, you know, I remember eight years old, nine years old, you know, making dinner for ourselves, making macaroni and cheese um, for dinner pretty much every night, you know, kids cuisine, mac and cheese, yeah, yeah. Mac sure. and, cheese and hot dogs kind of survived in that for, on that for a while. Um, uh, even th- through college, just having that like habit of eating terribly. And uh, yeah, so, um, you know, oddly though, you would think that I would have, um, I don't know, rebelled or, or, you know, reacted, you know, just kind of like, oh, this is just kind of like a free for all, you know, there was, there was just like no structure. Right. And I, I think about this a lot and I, I don't have a good answer for, for how this all panned out. But looking back, you know, I, because there was no structure, I sort of implemented it for myself. Uh, so to your point, yeah, I feel like I, I, this situation forced me to grow up um, really quickly, and I really owe music for providing a lot of that structure in my life because I I found myself at a even uh, starting at nine or ten years old, like joining orchestra and choral groups and all these like after school activities uh, because I wanted to be a part of all that. It, it gave me it gave me structure, it gave me purpose, um, and I didn't really want to be home. <laughs> to be when honest, think of, when you think about all the ways that could have gone, it's really remarkable that you were able to find like a structured environment to grow into uh, in music. Whereas like, I mean, New Haven, like if you don't grow up in the tri-state area, if you're from somewhere else, you just think, oh, well, there Yale is there. It must be a really nice town. <laughs> and um, you meet people from there and they're like, yeah, not really. No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say like people from Connecticut are like the friendliest bunch. So, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, and it's part. Honestly, it's part of what I why I got out of there. Yeah. Um, and of course, like any place, there. You know, someone once said to me, Ryan, there there are angels and assholes every everywhere in the world. You know, no matter where you go. Um, and you know that that's that was just as much true as it is in Connecticut as it was in Georgia. Yeah. And I, I really had some very generous and kind musical mentors that had, had a really profound uh, effect on me uh, in my Connecticut years. So, yeah. 
Yeah. At some point you moved out and you went to that town where you worked in a pizza place. Yeah. So th- that was sort of, you know, by my own choice, just wanting to kind of be off on my own and have, um, you know, get a little bit of distance from some, some drama that was going on at home. Um, and, and, uh, the, the family that I worked for at this small family owned, uh, restaurant in Stony Creek, they, they were, um, some of the, just the kindest people. And th- those, th- they were some of those exceptions <laughs> that I just mentioned of, of really amazing people that, that live in Connecticut. And, yeah. uh, they, they treated me like a son. They really did. Um, they, they paid me more than I needed to, uh, because I think they saw what was going on and it, they, they recognized I was having a difficult time. They, they put me up in their house, um, one summer or for an extended summer when, when I was working there full time. And even, uh, when I left, it, it was one of the kindest acts. Um, when I, when I moved to Georgia and made that decision to move down to Athens, they, they left me with a gift of a, a Vox AC 15 oh, that, really? that they found at a tag sale. Yeah. And they said, you know, go make music and be famous. <laughs> It was, so, it, was, it was so nice. Yeah. It was so yeah. Nice. So uh, well, the way that I know about this for people who don't know us both is that we were on tour with Easter Island and we were playing New York City and we had a college gig somewhere in Connecticut and you had glanced at the map or on your phone and we're like, oh man, we're going right by Stony Creek. And we went to this beautiful little resort town that you had escaped to out of the chaos of your family of origin there in New Haven and sort of began the process of building your adult life, working and and practicing music and and sort of got taken in by this incredibly sweet and kind family from that town who owned a pizza place. Yep, absolutely. And I, I worked there for uh, seven years, uh, not continuously. It was, you know, on and off and like mostly, you know, more so during summers and weekends or vacations. Um and, you know, all throughout college, um, you know, that was one of my jobs to kind of stay afloat and help to pay for my tuition. So they um, they did really well by me. Um, I had this, I had this yeah. mental picture of young Ryan, like just like relentlessly practicing guitar or bass with this idea that this is how I'm going to survive this. Was that ever like a conscious part of your thinking about music or were you just like? obsessively practicing because it helped to sort of bring some order and, 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 and channel some of the anxiety you were feeling in this kind of chaotic early life. Yeah. I I don't think er, that early on I saw music as like a means to make a viable living. It it was more the latter that it was this really powerful outlet. I didn't even think that I would ever be in a band that, that didn't really come till, till later on. It was almost kind of, accidental and yeah. it was almost like the universe was just like kind of pushing me in that direction and when when it did it was like a game you know that was just like a game-changing experience for me yeah it, you know as as i'm sure you know it being playing in bands can be pretty addicting <laughs> yeah i mean it's yeah it's the thing that we do and it's just it's always going to be the thing that we do i think i mean mm-hmm. fuck i'm i'm 50 you know and still out of the clubs Mm -hmm. a couple nights a week. Absolutely. Yeah. I have this theory about the sort of virtuoso players that we can point to like Jaco Pastorius or Miles Davis or Jimi Hendrix and say, look, these are the guys that really wrote the book about the instrument. But like what kind of mindset do you have to be in that you sit down and practice for a 10 hour day? Like, like happy people that go to the park. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's actually it's really interesting you bring that up. <clears throat> so let me kind of tie all this together by saying that you know when when I first started really like hitting the shed as they would say like the jazz cats. <laughs> but that woods. by the way yeah that yeah. that term for people who aren't like nerds like us means yeah. wood shedding is a term for like locking yourself in and practicing relentlessly. So hitting the shed, shedding, wood shedding, those are all terms for like focusing ridiculous amounts of emotional and intellectual energy on playing your instrument. 
Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, I could be totally off base here. I feel like I, I may have learned this years and years ago that that term actually came from jazz musicians who were maybe of like a lower socioeconomic order that only had like the option of practicing in like a tool shed or a wood shed. Um, yeah. You know, that were more or less poor and like were looking for a place to practice. And that was, you know, a place where a musician could practice where they wouldn't be like making a lot of noise, you know, about, you know, bothering someone in the house. Yeah, there's a lot of aspects <laughs> of early um, American music like jazz and blues that are directly related to economic scarcity, like the steel guitar, the sort of great Delta blues instrument that is such so integral to um, jazz and blues from from the Delta and, and from the American South. The reason that they had steel guitars was because you had to leave it on the porch. It was a tool. There were like a, a lot of people living in a small space, and to like drag a, a musical instrument into that space was uh, superfluous and, and kind of seen as frivolous. And so you'd leave your steel guitar out on the porch, and it would survive the weather. <laughs> Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, so um, on this topic of uh, virtuosity, when I was practicing for you know six to eight hours a day, you know, for, for when I was younger, it was definitely more of a, a means for you know a vehicle as a as a as an emotional outlet, and it was just fun too. Aside from that, I just I just it was just like a blast. I just you know loved that time being alone and practicing my instrument. And, you know, that's, that's how I became proficient, you know, pretty quickly at a young age. And then when I started to attend the Hart School of Music in my college days, um, being a part of the, the jazz department and, and that whole thing, um, I really didn't enjoy myself that much. And the main reason was because I just, I just couldn't believe I, the egos. I, it was unbelievable. I never experienced like when I was, when I was attempting virtuosity at a younger age, it was like fun, right? And like I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I just, it was like an outlet. It was fun, um, and, and and in some cases, like practicing a really difficult passage is like solving a puzzle or something. Totally. Uh, and then when I got to the heart school the 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 amount of egos was just out of control um and that it was just never about that for me and and it really turned me off and that 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 was the stage where i kind of like had to make a decision where i was like okay like if i want to be a virtuoso if i want to be like a pat metheny or something like, yeah like i i i understood at that point cuz i saw other kids doing it like locking themselves away in practice rooms but I got to be honest to you, a lot of those kids were pretty highly dysfunctional uh, and weren't exactly people persons. Um, yeah. And I, when I saw that, uh, I, I just I decided, you know what, I'm OK with being good enough in my instrument. Um, and I'd ra I would rather be, you know, a well-rounded and empathic person. Um, and, um, you know, I just at, at that point, too, I just kind of got more into the craft of like a, a beautifully written song was more impressive to me than like being like a Michelangelo Badio playing a double necked guitar with both hands or something. You know, like, <laughs> just, and what is it too with like, it's always Italians that uh, like, you know, it's always know. Steve Vai, Michelangelo Badio. Um, right. I, I, I know I'm missing um, a bunch of them, but I can tell you that like 90% of them are Italian. Joe uh, Satriani. Yeah, that's that's who I was trying to think of. Joe Satriani yeah. and um, I got, uh, Charlie Bonatti, uh, the drummer from Anthrax, is one of those like super technical, like eight hundred miles an hour drummers. Um, was Joe Pass had, Italian? I have no idea. Not sure. I'll have to look that up. But he does. He did look Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. So, yeah, you had a really crabby bass teacher at some point during that time. <laughs> I did. He was a pothead too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, nothing against that. I live in Colorado, but yeah. He he would say uh, he would be so stoned in the elevator at the art school. I was like, how is this guy like a staff? Like he was like full time faculty, and he was yeah. like eyes were always so bloodshot. 
and he'd be like, oh, my glaucoma is acting up again. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, he was he was brutal. That was another thing about the heart school, man. It felt like prison. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I saw faculty members um, make students cry. Yeah. Like tell people that they were worthless or that they can they should consider being a musician like they should like reconsider whether they should play music at all and i was like that that school was this school was expensive like what like i thought we were here to learn right like we're like okay if if we're not if someone's not proficient in their instrument like lead us teach us you know but it it was more like teaching through fear well, that's like that, um, that. A lot of the faculty there was guys who had kind of washed out of the New York jazz scene, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so some they, of them, um, believe it or not, would would um, gig more in Japan than in New York City, um, because that that seems to be at least at that time in like the early two thousands that yeah. that was the opportunities were. So, uh, a lot of faculty would be often like on leave to be like gigging in Japan. So. Rolled into all of this mix of this like obsessive musician who was sort of fleeing the sadness and tension of of of, of this kind of disrupted home. You're also battling the early stages of thyroid dysfunction, right? Yes, absolutely. And and uh, I suspect that may have started in my early twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Have you are you familiar with the um the ACE? Score the adverse childhood experience oh, yeah. trauma index. Very very familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Have you have you done the test? I have. I have done it a number of times, and you know, I've, I've absolutely, uh, unsurprisingly, have had pretty high scores. I can't recall. I would say maybe somewhere between like a four and an eight. You know, we did this um, on a recent podcast where I went through and and I had a guest who had a ten. Mm-hmm. Out of out of possible ten, which is the highest, he was a former IV drug addict, someone mm-hmm. I love very much. But when you talk about A scores over four, um, you start to see these like really um, extraordinarily high numbers of um, of actual physical health outcomes. Um, once you get above four. Th- the likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease. I pulled pull up the document while we were talking. Yeah, sure. Scores yeah. of four above. Likelihood of chronic pulmonary lung disease increases 390 mm-hmm. percent. Hepatitis 240 percent. Depression 460 percent. Attempted suicide 1,220 percent. More or less, I've read that like the likelihood of developing some kind of chronic illness shoots up to about 99% when you've had one or more adverse childhood experiences. So so essentially what that means is profound. It means that you're basically guaranteed to develop some kind of chronic illness as an adult if you've had like a disrupted, you know, childhood. Yeah, I was reading um about this book The Body Keeps Score. Yep, uh, I've read it, very familiar with it. Yeah, so I was wondering if what you felt like uh, if there might be a correlation between this sort of chronic thyroid dysfunction you've experienced as a young adult and as now as an adult adult, um, and just the like never ending stress of your early childhood. Uh, one, yeah, 100%. So, you know, in my, in my other life, I'm also a functional health coach and it's, it's something that I've studied a lot, particularly thyroid health and thyroid function. Define functional health coach real quick for me. Yeah, so basically it's kind of like somewhere in between being a health coach and being a naturopath. So I do have the ability to run functional lab work with my clients. And, and when we use that word functional, by the way, it's it's referring to this concept of restoring function to the body rather than suppressing symptoms with you know medications and surgery, right? Not to say that those don't have their place in certain situations, but it's kind of like a more like a, of a root cause analysis, like a reverse engineering. So yeah. instead of looking at your lab work and saying, you know, let's try to force this number up or down, it actually says, well, what's causing this to begin with? Um, you know, is it gut dysfunction? Is it hormone imbalance? Is it, you know, toxins or heavy metals? Um, and it's working at that kind of more root cause level. 
my, one of my favorite illustrations of that dichotomy was I, I was dating this hippie girl many, many, many years ago, and uh, I was putting chapstick on my lip or, or, or Carmex or something because my lips were chapped. And she looked at me, and she's like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, my lips are chapped. She's like, why are you trying to fix a problem on the outside of your body when the problem is inside your body? You just need to drink more water. Right. You're dehydrated. Right. Yeah, and so I, uh, that, like the rest of that day, I was just drinking water, and, and, and by, you know, by nine or ten o'clock, my chap lips were fixed. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's a great, a great anecdote. And so, yeah, along those same lines, like the the functional community would view the entirety of conventional medicine as kind of like the situation where you have like a rock in your shoe, uh, and you're taking Tylenol for the pain, right? right? Instead of just going, oh, I've got you know, I've got a rock in my shoe. Let me take the rock out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I help people do is, is find that rock. Um, so, but you spent, I remember that many years, uh, in Easter Island, like you were struggling with lethargy and, and sometimes you would actually just get fucking confused. Like it was, <laughs> it, it, was yeah. it was, it was, it was like, you know, I, I, there were times when I would, we would work, we would write, we would record and I would see Ryan at like a hundred Watts, you know, a hundred watt bulb. But then there was a significant chunk of the day when you weren't focused or being sort of like taking all of the energy you had to like focus on a task when you were just kind of untethered. It was like 40 watts of the possible hundred. You, you would you, you would be tired. Uh, you, you would sometimes just get like a little disoriented. And uh, and and it wasn't until years later you got your Hashimoto's diagnosis. Yeah, and so that's that's really accurate. It was definitely like the the lights weren't on. had had massive brain fog and sometimes just confusion. Um, even uh, I would take it a step beyond that to try to like give you um, a sense of what it felt like to be in my body. I, I often felt like I was just a um, like a passive ob- observer of reality. Like I didn't actually feel like I was a part of it. Uh, it's that's probably the best way I can explain it. It was just like I was kind of just watching everything, um, and it, everything kind of felt like a slow motion movie. Um, and because I often felt like this passive observer, there would be this like lag time or buffer between the time someone might ask me a question, and it would like register in my brain. You know, maybe five minutes later, that oh, okay, question, uh, this this warrants an answer. Right. To kind of like it was really like this just um, extremely slow functioning of my brain. You also had like a limited ambition or limited vision of what was possible for you at that time. And one of the clearest illustrations of that I can think of was we're playing in a band together. You're this super talented, good looking guy, sensitive, creative. I thought the world of you and there was a girl you had a crush on. We're not going to mention her name now. But it became kind of a thing like Ryan really likes this girl. And and finally one day I was like, Ryan, you like her so much, you should like ask her out. And there was this look like you looked past me like 100 miles away and you were like, nah, I don't think so. It was yeah. like <laughs> – I mean I – yeah, I mean it's something I've worked on tremendously and continue to work on. Uh, I would say at that time – my self-esteem was was incredibly low. It was really incredibly low. A lot of that had to do with how I was feeling, with my with my chronic fatigue and brain fog and depression. Uh, I just that that uh, low self-esteem also just translated into what I like you said what I thought was possible, and so I just didn't even. It was just easier for, easier for me to not even consider uh, dating like in the realm of possibility. It was just like it was just much easier to assume that would never happen, um, b- partially because my my energy was so low. I had very very narrow bandwidth. Um, no exaggeration. There were, there were days when my energy was so low that like <clears throat> I would kind of make a mental checklist of like very basic things to do. So e- if I got like a couple email replies done. That was like a big accomplishment for me. And, you know, there were days where I mo- more or less like was hiding away 
uh, in my bedroom. Um, and was because I was so tired and fatigued. I just like, there were days when I, I, I couldn't get up to, uh, and had no motivation. Just, well, I, I, I think that like we, 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 we can sort of point to your Hashimoto's diagnosis and all the work you've done since then to sort of claw your way back. But at the same time, like all of these symptoms are indistinguishable from chronic depression. Mm, yeah. Right. And right. To anyone looking in from the outside, it would just be like, oh, well, Ryan's really depressed. He spends most of his life depressed. And it's like not everyone is fortunate enough to like stumble into a diagnosis of like, well, you've got thyroid dysfunction. But like you were managing all of the symptoms of depression pretty much all the time. Yeah. And I, you know, also, uh, and I feel like you, you might know this better than I would, but perhaps this is a feature of, of depression as well. But I didn't want, I didn't ever want to put place that burden on anyone else. Um, so I didn't talk about it. I, I didn't want to drag anyone else down. I didn't want anyone else's problem. Any, you know, I didn't want my problem to be anyone else's problem. Um, so that That's probably nice. prevented me from figuring out the problem sooner, to be honest. But that's like a step that I see depressors take to isolate that eventually, if it gets severe enough, they start thinking things like, it would be better if I just wasn't this burden on all these people around me. And yeah, they, they right. isolate and start thinking that maybe doing something drastic to take themselves out of the consideration of others seems like a rational decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can see how that would be like the next step for some people, for yeah. sure. Patrick, if you if you don't mind, I, I want to take a, a step back to to answer your earlier question because uh, I feel like it actually might help some some listeners that could be struggling with some of these same issues. Uh, because you had asked if there was a, a link between a possible link between thyroid dysfunction and you know these these early adverse experience, early childhood experiences, or, or early childhood traumas. And I wanted to answer that question specifically. Okay. So, you know, in my research, uh, I came across, so someone that I follow in this sort of functional thyroid space or community uh, is this woman named Isabella Wentz, who's a, a pharmacist that kind of um, dug her way out of the, the conventional world and, and into this more world of like holistic, you know, f uh, functional uh, perspective. Um, and she has this theory called the, the safety theory. That what happens with many people with thyroid conditions is that when they've had an adverse uh, experience, now it helps to understand like a little bit of the basics of what the thyroid actually does, and it's sort of the the master control center for your endocrine system for your for your hormones, and it controls the rate of your metabolism. And so, what happens? Her theory is that when you've experienced uh, extensive trauma the thyroid can actually intentionally turn off or slow down your entire metabolism as a way to force your body to slow down and rest and heal, right? So in this sense, the, the, she refers to the thyroid itself as like the, the canary in the coal mine. And what, what that means is that the, the thyroid dysfunction itself isn't the problem. It's a symptom of trauma, and that the, that the body is intelligently using the thyroid as this kind of, again, master thermostat metabolic, um, you know, regulator to slow down all the processes in the body to get you to conserve energy. Right. It, it, when you also consider that uh, uh, women have rates of hypothyroidism that are about seven times greater than men. It's like seven times more likely in the female population. But they do so much more emotional work around they, men. Exactly. They, they do so much more emotional work. They're, they're on average subject to, to way, way more trauma and abuse. Yeah. And, and uh, thirdly, a lot of women develop Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism after pregnancy um, as, as, you know, <clears throat> and that often coincides with this kind of postpartum condition. And, you know, you could, you could say that pregnancy is sort of a trauma uh, on the physiological side of the body. 
Um, <clears throat> so you you often see uh, women develop that after after their their first or second child. Um, so. Uh, yeah, in a nutshell, though, to answer that question, I think there, there there is a strong correlation between, you know, and as you know from Bessel van der Kolk's book that you mentioned, uh, the body keeps the score. Yeah. You know, when you've had a traumatic experience, it's it's not just gone and in the past. It basically that trauma embeds itself in the body in at the cellular level, and until you've done the work to I guess, for lack of a better term, detox from it or to process that trauma, it's going to be embedded in your cellular programming and in your nervous system. And it's going to alter the way that your that your physiology functions at, at a cellular level. And so, you know, eventually it can manifest in things like thyroid dysfunction or diabetes or, or even cancer, right? Heart um, disease. Heart disease, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not I'm sitting and listening a lot right now because my mind is racing about how all these things are potentially connected together, like adrenal fatigue, heart disease, um, post-traumatic stress disorder related illnesses like hypervigilance and anxiety and all this thing just seems really interconnected to me right now. And, and that's something I, I really emphasize when I work with clients is is this foundational concept that everything is interconnected there's 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 no irrelevant historical fact or piece of information when you're when you're looking at the totality of, of someone's you know current state of health and their symptom history when you say do the work like so you know it, this is going to be embedded in your your essential being until you do the work talk to me about the work what is the work yeah, so I'm not like a licensed therapist or a trauma expert by any means like I I'm more of like a my expertise is more with like physiology and metabolic function, but what I'll often do if I recognize those patterns of trauma in a client is I'll recommend that they go and do something like EMDR or or heart math or you know some other kind of uh, cognitive therapy. Um, trying to think of of what else. Um, I mean, there's free versions of this in the form of 12-step programs for adult children of alcoholics like Al-Anon and other things, too. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so so what's unique, though, about some of these other approaches as opposed to just kind of like talk therapy, though, is that, you know, like, are you familiar with EMDR? Is that the eye movement thing? Yeah, it's eye, it's eye desensitization yeah, movement. Uh, I'm I'm clo- I'm circling it. I'm, I'm trying to remember the actual acronym, but yeah, it does have to do with. Um, again, I'm you know I'm not like an EMDR specialist or anything, but I, I know the basic concept is that it it kind of gets you to recreate in your waking experience um, this you you know um recreating this experience of of that rapid eye movement like when you're in a, a state of deep sleep yeah. right um and recreating that through um a form of of rapid eye movement where you're like kind of looking back and forth between two switches in your hand and it, it it's almost like it helps you to unwind or or process the, a, a certain memory or trauma so you can like remove it um, from your from your subconscious, so it's no longer, you know, part of your unconscious programming. Yeah, um, I think for a lot of people who aren't really already in this process, though, like I think any of these would be good approaches. But the first step is is to acknowledge, to have someone say to you, and for you to feel it on a, like a, a deep emotional level that these things that happen to you shouldn't have happened to you. And we should acknowledge that you have experienced trauma that you should never have had to endure, especially as like little Ryan, you know, like that little kid shouldn't have had to go through all this stuff. And I think that then I think that's the thing that so many people who I love deeply and care about are, are, and part of the reason I do this show at all is they're walking around with these like vaguely formed assumptions about whose fault it was and how much of it they deserved and whether or not they should really like igno- like well what happened to me wasn't that bad really like it was fucking terrible and and and, mm-hmm. and and to be told like okay man 
None of this shit should have happened to you. It wasn't fair. wasn't right. None of that should have been laid on little kids' shoulders. Um, and then mm. th- w- once you sort of admit that, I think, and accept that it wasn't your fault and that there's some work to be done, then I think that the world kind of opens up a little. And Patrick, what do you think leads someone into that realization? I mean, my a lot of my thinking about this is shaped by my experiences in 12-step programs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, because I came to it as an addict, but then realized that there were other things that I had to work on. Uh, part of the reasons that I became an addict in the first place, but also reasons that I was carrying around this tremendous emotional weight. And in the 12-step world, which I realize is, is very narrowly focused on the people that it helps, and it's helped a lot of people, but it's not for everybody, blah, blah, blah. But you have to hit a bottom, right? You have to get to a point where you can no longer cope with life using the tools that you've had in your in your arsenal up to that point. For in, in the, uh, For alcoholics or drug addicts, it's like, Alcohol and drugs are no longer doing the job that they've done for me for most of my life to help me stay one step ahead of my emotional trauma. Mm-hmm. And, and, and for codependents or adult children of alcoholics or, or people who have been traumatized by a dysfunctional family member or loved one, you have to get to a point where you're like, okay, this isn't working. The tools that I have aren't working anymore. And I'm sad all the time and I'm anxious all the time. And I have a relationship that is that I got into. A lot of times people get to Al-Anon because there's a new relationship in their life or one that's very important to them that is going away because they don't have emotional and neural pathways to be like a healthy partner in a relationship. And so their anxiety and their fear and their insecurity are causing instability in the relationship and at some point they have like a light bulb moment where they're like i have to go and unpack all the bullshit that i'm carrying around from my dysfunctional family of origin so that i could be present and 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 available to my partner now so it comes becomes kind of a functional bottom just like waking up in jail is for a drunk Mm mm-hmm yeah, and you know, you, you made such an important point there that you know so many people don't have a a, a framework or a schema. You know, they, they, there's that that network for that like literal network of neurons in the brain for healthy behavior might not even be present. I mean, so many people have an instant panic reaction when intimacy becomes a possibility. You know. Like, because there was a fucking toxic mm. person in their life who would use any true element of their emotional life as a weapon against them. And, you know, and that's why so many people with trauma in their past repeat those same mistakes. Because it's just how it works, right? Mm-hmm. You know? it, yeah, right. And and that's what that's what they've seen as an example in life. And so th- that's why I had mentioned earlier this, you know, idea of of finding a, a methodology um, you know, and and I, I and fully acknowledging what you said as well of, of you know f- first you have to kind of like come to some very basic understandings of, of realizing that what what happened to you was not normal and that you didn't deserve that experience. Yeah. And, and um, once you get that beyond, once you get to a certain point of self actualization, I think what can be really life changing is is you know, finding a mo- modality uh, again, whether it's like EMDR or or uh, an RTT form of hypnosis or or dynamic neural retraining. You know, some some kind of system. Uh, you know, for and for you, you know, it was it was a lot of that was the twelve step program, but um, yeah, some way of helping to process that trauma. Yeah, the twelve step thing was really like it was the tools that I had at the time, and they've been really effective for me. But I. I, I feel like people should find whatever path they can. Hey, 
Hey, Crash and Ride would like to let you know about a new industry-wide initiative focused on mental health called Backline. Backline is a hub for artists, industry professionals, and their families to quickly and easily access mental health and wellness resources. Backline is partnered with leading support organizations and care providers to streamline access to services specifically geared towards the music industry. Go to www.backline.care to get the support that you need to thrive both on and off the road. The way that Backline works is you contact them via their website or their 800 number and they will connect you with a caseworker. That caseworker will be familiar with resources in your area to get you the mental health care that you need. If you need to talk to a therapist, they can put you in touch with a therapist. If you need to talk to a psychiatrist and be evaluated for meds, they have a list of psychiatrists. They have resources for inpatient therapy. They can put you in touch with sober companions. If you need someone to travel with you while you're on the road and help you stay out of trouble, Backline is a really end-to-end comprehensive solution for people who are struggling in the music industry. Now, a little closer to home, if you're in the Athens, Georgia area and you're a musician struggling with anxiety and depression, you can contact NucciSpace at 706-227-1515 or go to nuci.org. That's nucci.org. NucciSpace is a nonprofit musician's resource focused on suicide prevention. Here's how Nucci's works. If you contact them and you say, hey, look, I'm in crisis, whether you're a musician or not, they'll connect you with resources in the Athens, Georgia area. If you're a musician, that health care will be subsidized. In my own case, I was able to see a counselor for 15 or 20 bucks a session. If you're not a musician, they'll do their best to connect you with low cost or sliding scale options for mental health care in Athens. Nuju Space provides a lot of resources for musicians in the Athens area. They have low cost practice spaces, they have a gear cell where they're constantly selling second hand gear, they've got a low cost recording studio. They're really just an amazing asset to the Athens, Georgia music scene, but their primary mission is helping people who are depressed or anxious get better. Go to nuci.org, that's nuci.org, or call 706-227-1515. And finally, no matter where you are, if you're struggling with anxiety and depression and you're contemplating self-harm, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at one 1- 800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. It's 24-7. It's free. It's confidential. They have trained volunteers to help get you through your crisis and get you the help that you need. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. kind of contextualize all of this like you've been a professional musician pretty much since you were in your early 20s like you, mm-hmm. you had the band echelon yeah. which um i guess you were at 19 when that band started i think 17 actually we and we started touring at that at that age we, we were even, we were playing at clubs in new york city and there were more there was more than one instance where i either talked to the club owner on the phone or like sent an email like basically begging them to let us play and saying like, hey, I know we're we're underage, but, you know, we promise we're not going to drink and we're just going to play and then, you know, immediately leave after our set. <laughs> and uh, that would work uh, more often than not, believe it or not. Well, it was um, a different time. It was, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that would work today. No, no. Idea. I don't I don't have like a, a 17 year old kid who's trying to trying to play gigs in New York City. So <laughs> I don't know yeah. what it's like now. Yeah. Yeah, but um, Echelon uh, became another band. Tell me the name of that band again. Yeah, so after e- Echelon was together for about four or five years, and then after that was Shadowgraphs. Yeah, and yeah. both of those bands made records um, that got the attention of Sony Music, and also you guys got a publishing deal, and you mm-hmm. have continued to hammer at it. Every- when I met you, you had moved to Athens, um, and... And despite like struggling with the the physicality of this 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 um, thyroid dysfunction and and everything else, you were still managing to produce records for other artists. Uh, we met the night you were working with Nat- Natalie Riccio at, yeah. at uh, the big uh, the big studio here, Studio Ten Ninety Three. And she had come down, and you were producing the record. You'd hired session musicians and all that. And there was that insane snowstorm. Remember that? I do. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that shut down for a week. Um, 
and then we started working together in Easter Island. I guess it wasn't like a year after that. And that was kind of a sort of a, a, a real peak of the havoc that your thyroid was wreaking in your life. And when you were in Easter Island, I remember you were often really struggling. Yeah, it's funny too, you know, working on all this music in the midst of this undiagnosed condition that, you know, I, I had to wait several years yet to, to find out what was going on. And, you know, if, if you go back and listen to my, or at least I can hear it when I go back and listen to my solo album, which was just under the name Monahan, right. I, I can hear it. I could hear it in my voice. I, I can remember too, working with Eric Fryer and, and Asa Leffer, um, you know, doing like 50 or more vocal takes just, just because I was so, so fatigued and, and I, but I, w- I had so much willpower to, to get that done. Like I just, that was such an important, um, accomplishment or, or milestone for me to get there to finish that solo album. Uh, I remember even ta- at what, as a result of being really chronically ill for so long, you, you probably remember this well, I struggled with really, really chronic sinus issues. Yeah. Like in post nasal drip. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Like, it, that sounds kind of lame. Like, Poor Ryan, you had the sniffles. Like, but it, it's like, no, like, I could barely get through a conversation without like snot like running down the front of my face. No, that's, and was, I've heard someone say that that is one of the symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. I mean, it, you, the thing is, when you're when you're in a hypothyroid state, everything slows down. Like I was mentioning, how the thyroid controls your metabolism earlier, and so that includes your digestion, your mood, your immune function, right? So you're like, in a sense, imagine your immune function like slowing down. So that's why all the symptoms are associated with uh, with a slowing down of the metabolism. So you see things like constipation, weight gain, depression. Um, you know, under under immune function, those would all be categorized as like a slow metabolic rate. Right? And you were throwing every kind of behavioral and dietary modification at trying to fix this when we were early, early in our friendship. You you were alternately eating only plant based foods or only um, uh, actively avoiding all gluten or, or you know white flour and like. It was just like this never ending yeah. cycle of like trying to figure out. I remember when you got your Hashimoto's diagnosis, that was about six years later, I think, and you got Synthroid for the first time, and suddenly yeah. <laughs> the lights came on. Right. New man. Yeah. And I wish I, I, I might, if, if you don't, if you can indulge me, we might put a before and after picture of you then oh, versus yeah. you happy. now because the change is so remarkable. And, and if I might, uh, interject here uh i will use this as a a bit of a platform moment just because i think it's it's such a important public service announcement that i had for so many years blamed myself for my own failings whether that was my health or my depression and yes sure like some of that was circumstantial and perhaps even to some extent, some of that may have been triggered by underlying uh, emotional trauma. But the the profound realization that I had was that it was not my fault. Like my body was failing me, right? So it was this very simple fix to replace the thyroid hormone that was missing in my body to literally turn the lights back on. And I stand here today with... I don't get depressed anymore. I get down. I get disappointed, but I don't get in that like shrouded shroud of like dark clouds coming over me for no reason, you know, and not 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 able to crawl out of it for weeks kind of thing. Um, I can hardly even remember what that feels like. And that was the, the primary mode of my existence for so many years. Decades. Decades. Yeah. So I say this because if you're suffering from depression, I feel like getting a, a routine thyroid screening is just like rule that out as a possibility. It's such a basic thing. It's so common. I think something like 14 million Americans or, or more um, are diagnosed with Hashimoto's or a, or a, or a hypothyroidism. So Man, I hate to politicize this, yeah. uh, uh, but like 
we really are a culture where trauma is just a byproduct of daily life because I mean, it's just really, really hard. Um, yeah. I mean, if you look, right. If you look at like the macro perspective of this, it's like, why are the, why are there these like massively increasing rates of hypothyroidism and, and which, which obviously coincides with depression for many people. And so you, you could say that as a culture we're we're becoming more traumatized and and we're we're also inheriting you know another thing that that Bessel van der Kolk talks about in the body keeps the score is that we can actually inherit generational trauma through like epigenetic expression yeah right? i believe that yeah. 10 years ago i would have told you that sounded like hoodoo like airy fairy bullshit but like as i've started to do the work on my own mm -hmm. family trauma i see it passed down from yeah. the really skint back appalachian roots of my family where no one ever had enough of anything to you know my experience growing up and and there's if i could find these studies i'm sure i could find them pretty quickly i'll, I'll share them with you there's been these studies done with rats where they've actually shown this, where like obese rats or mice will will actually their their children will be obese um, at from from day one just because they've inherited that sort of epigenetic set from the from the mother and father mouse or rat, um, and you know they they'll inherit that trait just like you would in uh, you know inherit. Uh, you know, blue, brown versus blue eyes or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they've, they've done the reverse where they put the mouse on a diet or something. And then they're shown with the, with the offspring that, you know, the children, the, the younger mice grow up like skinny. Um, so they've actually proven this with experiments in a number of different ways that you can actually, you know, pass on these, um, these diet and lifestyle traits, like, you know, which we, we hadn't really considered before. Like you can, of course, inherit risk for cancer or heart disease or something like that. We've known that for a while. Uh, but I think we're coming closer to understand that you can even pass on like emotional states um, or, yeah, just like inherited trauma and that sort of thing. Well, I was, I'm reading um, Carson McCullers again right now and stumbled across this quote. Um, it's weirdly wedged into the text. Like I think it's a realization she had and she had to find a character capable of voicing it in the text for Hardest Lonely Hunter. But she said resentment is the most precious flower of poverty. And that, that's a good one. Yeah. And like I, there's a part of me that's like uh, hesitant to make – blanket criticisms of working class people who are threatened by austerity and, and, and economic deprivation. But, but it is part of the emotional landscape of people I've known who were poor people in my family and the families that we grew up with, that there was a certain anger that kind of was always kind of ambient, like, and, 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 and you know, it's, it's been weaponized by, different political movements through the years, you know, like we got to find, we, we, there have been various political movements through the years that could, could, could vault themselves to political power by capitalizing on that ambient resentment. Mm. And we're mm. seeing it right now. Mm. Wow. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, for but, sure. For sure. I mean, have you, have you ever read the book Iron John or are you familiar with that? I remember when that movement sort of, um, the uh, fire in the belly and uh, what was that writer's name? William? No. Um, the power of myth. That whole thing popped up. In about uh, yeah, Joseph or Campbell. Three. Yeah, Joseph <laughs> Campbell. And there was a men's movement, a men's kind of 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 uh, like like a sort of. I think it, I think maybe for con contemporary audiences, it's hard to realize. It, it's hard to conceptualize of a time when. Men suddenly realized that they had to care about their mental health. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah, right, but right. That was the first time it became part of like modern life and my experiences. With people started talking about um, that men had emotional lives. Yeah, it's it's um, 
and that that's exactly what what the author gets to. I don't remember his name, but but in Iron John, is that uh, the root cause of a lot of society's ills comes down to m- men that have not been mentored in a in a proper way to to be taught how to deal with their emotions in a healthy way. And that if you look back to certain, you know, indigenous or, or, or tribal cultures, that that's, that is a cornerstone of those societies where at a, you know, at a certain age, men are, are initiated in a really systematic way yeah, and, and, and like integrated into society. And that is a, is a, a mechanism that is, you know, completely absent from from industrialized <clears throat> societies. You know, I want to talk about that a little bit in your context. And talk sure. like uh, talking about Ryan Monahan. Like, I didn't ever see anybody sort of take you into their wing, and and the and the times that we've known each other and kind of teach you uh, an appropriate emotional framework for how to respond to things. And yet. Post Hashimoto's diagnosis and when you started to really work on yourself and finally get like a fingernail into the crack of what was actually bothering you, I have seen you go through huge professional disappointments and frustrations and times when other people who I'm close to around you were like livid with rage all the time and you were just kind of like, well, you know, shit happens. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know where to start with that one. I had a guy once uh, read a hor- uh, horoscope and tell me that I was uh, a Buddhist monk in my past life. So, so who knows? I just have an inborn capacity to, to deal with um, disappointment. I don't know, man. That seems like a, 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 it seems like you're not giving yourself enough credit because, <laughs> like. We both know, and anybody listening to this who's involved in making art for a living knows that there are huge disappointments. Uh, like, mm. because this, like trying to become a professional artist in a society that doesn't have any safety net at all, um, it's like ch- just trying to land, it's, it's like trying to land a 747 on the head of a pin. Like, there's just so many things that have to go right, and most things don't. And so you walk around a lot of the time sort of struggling with resentment and anger and disappointment. And yet I have watched you sort of shepherd several projects and suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune with like dignity and grace and like at no point lash out at no point, blame anybody else for anything that you had done wrong. And I've always thought thought that was a really remarkable thing. Well, Patrick, I feel really grateful to have a a friend that, that has been there to see all that and, and to acknowledge that. So thank you. I really appreciate that. I really do. Uh, you know, as, as you were saying all this, I was trying to think about what has helped me shape my perspective on dealing with disappointment. And I, I guess I would go back earlier in our conversation to, I, I, I honestly think that I had early training in that. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, you know, I think, Having moved around so many times, having been to three different high schools, like when when I moved to when I ended up moving to to Alpharetta, Georgia, I was I was 15, and so I was in another region of the country. I was you know hormonal and and 15 years old and already depressed to begin with, and I thought that uh, you know moving in with my father for some time would would fix all my problems, um, and it turns out that it did not. Um, and I was equally depressed, if not more. Um, it was a really, really rough time. It was one of the most difficult times in my life. And what, what that taught me, though, was a really powerful lesson, which was that changing my external environment or circumstances had no bearing on my happiness. And so that taught me really, really early on. And I guess I would say I'm, I'm extremely grateful to to have this as a, as a skill set is that I, that happiness is a, is an inside job. It really is. And like you hear this in different ways and, and it almost starts to sound cliche, but you have very little to no control over what happens 
in your in your outside environment. You have no control over you know whether your band's going to become successful and and whether it's going to go to that next level. And so I, I think that it's it's just an essential skill to learn how to be happy before you get the thing, before the outcome that you're looking for. And yeah. if you can do that, you can become emotionally bulletproof and deal with just about anything because you're not going to let external s- circumstances dictate how you feel because you don't have the perfect relationship or you didn't get the job you want or your band didn't get that gig that you wanted or your band didn't get signed or um, you're not where you thought you would be in your career by this age. I mean, you can, it, it, I think also humans have a tendency to emphasize their headwinds and de-emphasize their, their tailwinds. Yeah. A- and I think that's embedded into human nature because we are, you know, we were equipped to learn our, our memories are built in to learn fear as a survival mechanism. So it was, it's more important that we remembered a mountain lion chasing us than it is like of having like a delicious meal. Right. So like fear serves this role of essential role of, of survival. But the problem is that we don't in the modern world, it's like this mismatch, right? Because we, we don't face these same existential threats of, of like infectious diseases and in like wild animals or even like natural disasters in many cases, like we're protected from a lot of that, but we still have the same inborn mechanism to make us afraid of everything. (laughs) Right. So I I think if you can understand too, that we are these like biological animals, like these creatures that have um, this overreactive um, fear mechanism, like we still have this ancestral lizard brain, um, that you can tell, you can kind of remind yourself, I think, um, if you can develop a, a bit of a sense of mindfulness, you can step back and say, okay, that's my, that's my lizard brain talking. Like, mm-hmm. is this situation actually as bad as my brain is telling me it is? Yeah. Yeah. I think gratitude plays a big part of that too. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Just being aware that you're fortunate and not dwelling on your misfortune is really important. And and even in even trying to cultivate a sense of like what your misfortunes have taught you and like how can you reframe those those events in your life as gifts? You know, like I often say that my Hashimoto's diagnosis was like one of the best things that could have ever happened to me because it it taught me to appreciate my health. And prior to that uh, I had very little sense of that. And now I place health above everything else in my life because I've, I've learned that it's the foundation. You know, f- you, you do everything with your body, right? Right. And I was so in my head, you know, when I was younger that, that I didn't see that. And I, I really... I, I think part of it too was was a survival mechanism. Like I, I was really only concerned with like making myself smarter, um, because that that was like how I I thought I was gonna you know get that was my almost like my main coping mechanism or addiction in a way was like just be just like thinking that I can outsmart my way through any situation. Yeah. Um, um, so I've, I've had to learn, you know, to, to also realize that, you know, even becoming addicted to knowledge in it, in itself could be a, a coping mechanism. Well, I think you or, see or, that a lot with a yeah. lot of sort of profoundly dysfunctional young men that, you know, there's, there's been this enormous, like online alarm about this involuntary celibate community incels and and their whole like reason and logic um thing it's it's an incomplete set of values that won't actually solve any of the real problems Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but it at least creates the illusion of having tools Um, yeah sure sure and it you know it, it might it might get you so far to a certain extent yeah but uh 
Yeah, even even you can even be attached to your own intellect like that in itself becomes a, a form of of control. And what well, that, that goes back to the heart school we were talking yeah. about, like these guys who really, really like hone their ability to play as fast as possible and as many notes as possible have this yeah. enormous theoretical um, advantage when in, in, in competing for gigs. But at the end of the day, like, but are you writing any great songs? Yeah. And touching someone's heart, which I think is, you know, I mean, I would just, you know, any day rather listen to like a, a beautifully written song by Cat Stevens than like a Steve Vai guitar solo. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, yeah. So I, I, I think so much of that is, yeah, kind of ego driven and not, not heart centered. Yeah. 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 Well, man, I usually wind these things up with 10 questions. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, if you're ready for that, we can jump in. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, what is the fondest memory you have of a meal that you've had? Yeah, so some of the, the fondest memories I have of eating meals was in those Easter Island days of like, you know, working on the record and, and eating at the National. And, you know, I, I remember that time really fondly because I've, I've, I, that, was, that was a time more than any other time when I felt like something big was going on. It, it really did feel like there was like a scene that we were a part of. Like yeah, the National, for people who don't uh, live in Athens or haven't visited here, the National is um, it's probably, I guess, it's Athens' fine dining restaurant, but because it's Athens, it's priced in such a way that like anybody can eat there. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I got to say, I, I've, I'm a foodie. I, I love eating and cooking. We cook a lot at home and I've eaten all over the world and and am always trying to you find the next best dining experience and I, I can't say I've, I've had a better eating or dining experience than at the national I just I just haven't found it do you have a favorite meal there <laughs> um gosh there, there was so many I, I I would say my favorite thing is there those deep fried Brussels sprouts which are are on um, they're, they're only seasonal they would only have them like in the fall yeah. Those are so good. Those crispy Brussels sprouts. I'm a big fan. With the like that uh, that aioli over it, so good. Yeah. Yeah, I I also had a, a really beautiful dining experience after uh, Lindy's father passed away, and we were in Iowa for her father's funeral. Lindy's your partner now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Going on six years. Can't believe that it. Not a lot of people uh, say that they had a um, a, a life-changing dining experience in Iowa. Well, also, I should clarify, you're right about that. You're right. <laughs> I would not say uh, <clears throat> Iowa's known for their uh, culinary expertise. So uh, we were... We were well, culinary adventurism. You should, I, I guess I should... Because right. I've had some really fresh, amazing, elemental, like farm to table meals in the Midwest, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. the sort of day to day food culture of Midwesterners is often kind of, well, this'll do. It's a lot of cheese and a lot of mayonnaise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so Lenny's, Lenny's father passed and you guys yeah, were there. And, um, she was needless to say distraught. And, you know, we were, we were just trying to find an opportunity to, to, um, to get away from the, I don't want to say drama, um, but it was it was a very emotionally heightened situation, and we were just trying to, you know, have a respite a little bit uh, from from that sure. from that whole day. And we so we drove to Omaha, and which is only about an hour um, over in Nebraska, so so her mother doesn't live too far from Omaha. And we ate at this French restaurant called, uh, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, Le Bayon. Le Bayon. And it was, it is very, it was funny because uh, a waitress we had met there had used to live in Athens and she knew Asher Payne. And no she way. used to work at the National. It was crazy. Asher Payne is one of the members of the band that uh, Ryan and I were in together, Easter Island. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, so it was just this really nice, quiet moment. It kind of like, you know, that sort of in the eye of the storm. And we just had like this amazing meal and the staff was was just like on point, um, just like, you know, a really good experience. And it was just this kind of really sweet, like tender moment where we we got to sit down and like kind of take a breather and relax. Um, and I, I had an amazing meal in Omaha once now that you mention it. Um, mm. there was the, there's a street there. I don't know if it still exists in the nineties. There was a street where there were all these thrift stores lined up. And that was a big part of what you did when you were a broke ass musician in the nineties, you would go hit thrift stores and try to find like a cool vintage suitcase to put your pedals and cables in or, um, a coat that you could survive Midwestern winter on tour. <laughs> um, because coming from Georgia, you didn't have that and you couldn't go out and spend three hundred, four hundred dollars on a, a parka from like North Face or Mountain Hardware or something. So we spent the day kind of kicking around on the little strip there in Omaha. And at the very end of that long row of thrift stores, there was like a food cart that was a Vietnamese food cart. And I had an amazing bowl of soup there. That sounds delightful. It was really good. I'm looking at this restaurant too here. It looks like there's still in operation there are Le Bouillon? yeah it's on yeah. Howard, Howard Street in Omaha um, which I think is in the area they call it like the I want to say like the old market yeah um, that's right down where all those, yeah okay oh yeah same, same area where you where you had the soup yeah 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 it, you know they Omaha's got a surprisingly um, great food scene if it's it got a great art scene too it I mean, t- you know if it wasn't so damn cold I would consider maybe living there. It's, it's a yeah, cool yeah. little city kind of feels a little like Athens. Like it's small and manageable. Well, the whole Saddle Creek records thing is there. And I think that yeah. like, it's definitely a lot of good stuff happening around that scene. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Second question. Yeah. What is the most frightened you've ever been? Oh yeah. This one was easy for me. This was getting lost on the broad river and having three rescue helicopters come looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> So the Broad River Outpost, did you rent? So here in Athens, just north of town, there's the Broad River Outpost, which you can rent a canoe or kayak for the day and float the river. And a lot of people go do that with a cooler, beer, and whatever. But were you alone that day or were you with someone else? I was with a friend, yeah. And you guys floated the broad and missed the takeout point. We missed the takeout point, and we thought that we hadn't reached it yet. So when when the sun started going down, we were like, okay, let's paddle harder. <laughs> you know, so we, we were actually drifting further and further away from it until we kind of made the grave decision to sleep overnight on the on the broad river with no clothes except for bathing the bathing suits we were wearing, uh, no phones, no wallets, because um, we left our phones in our car. You don't, you know you don't you don't bring your phone with you on a kayak. Um, yeah. Um, especially, you know, it's just like usually like a three hour thing, like a, an outing on the river, you know, kind of one and done. Uh, so we, yeah, we had no way to contact anybody. Um, and then, or probably around like two or three in the morning, we started seeing the helicopters, um, making their way down the river with the searchlights and everything. It was like something out of a movie. That's insane. Yeah, it, it was, it was insane. It was also freezing cold. And I thought an animal might try to eat me. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, the only thing that kept me going was knowing I had uh, a gig the next day, which was playing for Nolan Bennett's 10th birthday party at Cindy Wilson's house. Um, Oh, no kidding. Yeah, this was like when we were doing the, when I was doing the Beatles cover band thing. Yeah, yeah. That was our, our... that was my first time meeting Cindy Wilson was that next day after getting lost on the broad river. Insane. Yeah. Crazy. Of all the things in your life that you've lost, what is the thing that you regret losing the most? I often look back at like my college years and my twenties and wish I hadn't taken life. So uh, seriously, I didn't let myself really have much fun. Um, I was pretty focused, pretty hyper focused, like in like even in college, it was just like it was orchestra, jazz band, writing papers. Um, That was like my whole and then working, you know, I, 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 you know, maybe that's silly to say, but I just never had this kind of like 
wild phase of my of my life, like a lot of people do. And and I, I, I'm sure people on that side would say, you know, grass is always greener. Um, but, you know, like have like we talked about earlier, having had to grow up rather quickly, um, I've always been, you know, pretty, a pretty responsible dude. Um, so yeah, sometimes I, I look back and wonder, you know, like what, what life would have been like if I had let loose a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about a time you received an act of kindness from a stranger. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mentioned it earlier when the owners of the restaurant, gave me that parting gift when I left for Georgia, that the Vox AC 30, they weren't strangers. So maybe that doesn't count. Um, but I have a really good quote, which is, is one of my favorite JD Salinger quotes. And this is his, his one of his recurring characters from the glass family. And he said that I'm a, I'm a kind of paranoiac in reverse. I suspect people of plotting to make me happy. <laughs> I just like, I just so, always thought that was so kind of weird and and awesome. Yeah, like, I, like I just that. I I just love that idea of of what like what a great way to live your life to assume that strangers like are are always always have your best interest in mind or people that are plotting you know people that are plotting to make you happy because it's just such that's the opposite of how most of us think you know like we're we're always yeah. so. And especially with social media, we're just always so like wired to to assume that people are thinking terrible things about us. But the truth is that most people are more worried about themselves than than to have like time to to you know like take time out of their day to be to be like judging you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite place to gig? Yeah, so I, I thought about this one a little bit. I, I couldn't really come up with like an obvious answer. But I would say that my favorite place to gig would be when wherever I'm with the people that I care most about. So, you know, whether that's, you know, I mean, I would say at this moment, it's the, it's the guys in Easter Island, you know, because I, I think you you probably know this very well. You've, you've, you've toured in more than a dozen bands mm -hmm. and that the experience of who you're with is is what makes all the difference when you're touring with people that you don't connect with, uh, aren't on the same page with. It can be a nightmare. It's disastrous. It's disastrous. Yeah. So, like, it's funny because when I think about gigging, like the cities and 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 um, and the and the venues, like I, I for, I'll forget their names. I'll forget what city they were in. But I, what I don't forget is is like the memories of just like laughing our asses off in the van, like you know, filling out like a Mad Libs, and like you know, being like eight year olds again. Easter um, Island of all the bands <laughs> I've toured with, that band laughs the most of any band I've ever toured with. And it, it feels it just feels so good to laugh. Yeah. And yeah. and so yeah, th that's what I remember too. I don't I don't remember I just don't remember like venue names. I'm not some people are really good at that. I'm just not good at like it's just it just all blurs together for I don't even care to be honest. It's just usually like all right, well, you know, we're in the van, pop on the map, let's go to the next place. Yeah. But for the most part it doesn't even matter to me like where we are. It's just like the experience of um, again, like just being with people that, um, are supportive, um, is, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um, visa and income considerations aside, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? For, for so many years, I thought that place was, was here in Denver. And like, I've, I've always wanted to live, I've always been drawn to the mountains, the, to the Rocky mountains as I, sit here in my office looking out the window I've, I've got a straight shot view of of the rocky mountains right on my window it's it's really incredible um and now that i'm here <laughs> i miss i miss the warm <laughs> i miss the warm weather yeah. yeah you still get cold easy man i do i still do get cold easily yeah. yeah like my hands still get like ice cubes that's a thing with like hypothyroidism is like cold intolerance especially and your hands and feet, um, really common. Um, so yeah, I would say going forward, like anywhere that's warm, like year round, 
Yeah. Now that I'm, now that I'm like experiencing real winters again, like having yeah. to shovel snow, and I, I, I like only thought about the romantic parts of living here and forgot about all the all the like sludge and snow that you have to make your way out of. That's true. Yeah. Uh, do you have an ultimate musical instrument? And if you do, do you already own it or not? So I've never been much of a, a gearhead. I, I remember reading an interview with Frank Zappa, like I think in high school, like a long time ago. And he was asked a question, something along the lines of, you know, like if you were to give advice for, for choosing a guitar, you know, like the characteristics or the traits, like what do you look for? And his answer was pick something, just pick something that looks cool. (laughs) (laughs) And like, you know, if for those who haven't heard like Frank Zappa's like solo guitar albums, he's like a virtuoso. So it it was funny to hear him say that just like, just pick something that looks cool. I don't know. Uh, I loved that answer because it was just like, it's the musicianship that matters. Not the, not the instrument per se. Although if you combine a good musician with a good instrument, you'll, you'll have magic. But, you know, I think his point was just like, what's going to inspire you to play? You know, what's going to inspire you to pick something up? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I've never even been in a position to, or, or uh, to be one of those guys that has like 12 guitars hanging up on the wall. Um, so for the past m- more than 12 or 14 years, uh, you know, my my main guitar was my my Les Paul studio, which is an amazing guitar. Still have it. Um, and then only recently I've got that American uh, Jazz Master, which is, I would say, currently my perfect musical instrument. I think it really yeah. suits my personality. It has this beautiful, like, flesh. It's called, like, a shell pink color. Yeah, yeah. It's got a rosewood neck. It's extremely versatile. Uh, and I've, I've just always loved that that vintage jazz master look. Does um, it have a um, Does it have a mastery bridge on it, or do you have the factory trim on it? It's got the factory on it. Yeah, you don't have any tuning problems with it. No, no, uh, uh-uh. uh. This one is a like a limited edition, and and um, the the construction is slightly different on it, and I think they they tweak the the tuning issue a little bit on it. Yeah. Um, so they they only printed a limited run of these jazz masters that have the rosewood neck and the which is a, a shorter scale too uh, and um and the these this li- these limited colors like this one is in shell pink so they they just did like a limited run of them you're the third person who's mentioned the shell pink fender product in the uh, at this question um the first was uh, tyranny tough from the pauses she she had oh a, that makes sense yeah yeah she's got a um a mustang bass that shell pink that she just loves yeah I love pink. Yeah. <laughs> Is there an instrument that you've lost either from having to sell it or having to pawn it or having it stolen that you desperately wish that you could have back? <clears throat> um, I, I have lost an instrument. I can't say that I wish I had it back. Uh, I had a, like a really crappy acoustic guitar. That, that was the instrument that I learned on that like literally made my fingers bleed because the, the action was so high on it. Um, and that was just like, I don't know where it came from. Honestly, like I think... It was just like this this kind of like magical moment. Oh, I remember being ten years old and opening a closet in the basement, and there was this, <laughs> and there was an acoustic guitar in there, um, and that was and I I'd never found out. Um, I think it was might have been my oldest brother's, um, and maybe it was a gift to him, but it sort of became mine by default. Um, mm. But it was it was a pretty crappy instrument. It was definitely like a beginner's instrument, and then. Just out of graduating from college, I started uh, a brief, very brief career uh, teaching in the inner city school system in New Haven, which is um, which is pretty pretty brutal. Um, not to go on a tangent, but I at after about a year in the system, I had a, a student that uh, didn't show up to class one day and read in the newspaper that he got shot in the head. Um, so. Um, that gives you an idea so, of, of how rough it was. I'm so sorry, man. Oh yeah, I'm I'm sorry for his family. You know. Yeah. Um. So when I was working in the school system, I had that guitar uh, sitting in the back of my car, and then when I got out of work, uh, the the window was smashed in, and the guitar was gone. 
And I was actually more sad about that. They had actually stolen. I had a bag with all my sheet music in it too. And along with that was a bunch of uh, Vince Guaraldi transcriptions, <laughs> which oh, I, man. I had just bought. And I was like super excited to, I wanted to learn how to like play some of those like Vince Guaraldi Christmas songs on guitar. Yeah. And um, yeah, they took all my sheet music too. <laughs> I was more I was more bummed out about that than the guitar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then about within the next years, when I got my Larave, um, which I still have, and I love the shit out of that guitar. They are yeah. they're handmade in uh, British Columbia. Yeah, yeah. It's so you're... dry here though that the the neck just got really warped, like, and it got oh, really yeah. really bad string buzz. So I had to buy. It's kind of the opposite problem of in Georgia. I had to buy a humidifier for the for my room where the guitar is to, and a humidifier for the guitar so that the wood stays in in shape. Get it straightened out. I did. Yeah, I uh, Dave Demisi actually walked me through it over Facebook. So um, Dave Demisi is a local luthier here in Athens, Georgia, and he works on all of my guitars and and almost all of my friends' guitars. He's a really gifted guy. Yeah, he's the best. I wish I could clone him and have a uh, like. I just after just working with him for so many years, I, I don't I don't trust anybody else. He's so thorough and honest and and he's fair. my old roommate. Did you know yeah, that? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And we both uh, grew up in Guilford, Connecticut. Right. I forgot. Yeah. That. That's right. So, so weird. Yeah, we're both yeah. Connecticut people. Yeah. So he walked me through it, and you know, I ended up having to buy. It's not a standard truss rod. It's like a proprietary truss rod uh, tool uh, that you have to buy from Larave. So I had to special order that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like this really weird U-shaped tool, um, and it's really hard to access the the point of of um, the female side of the truss rod from the from the inside. So you have to have this weird U-shaped tool. But he told me this whole thing about like put your index finger down on the first fret and your pinky of your other hand down on the ninth on the twelfth fret and then look for like a tiny air gap at the ninth fret. Like this whole way of like determining the optimal uh, string height when you're adjusting the guitar. Um, I could I could tell you that after living with that guy for three years when we were younger, that I definitely want him to work on every one of my guitars, but I'll never live with him again. Because <laughs> he's almost thorough to a fault. Oh, buddy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it makes him but to his credit, it makes him really good at what he does. Oh no, he's he's absolutely brilliant. He's a genius, but he's yeah. very particular about how things should be. Yep. <laughs> yeah. If you could be a guest uh with any band or artist that you love um and sit in for one song at a show, what what artist would that be and what song would it be? Band of Gypsies. <laughs> yeah, which I, song? No, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Um, What's your favorite song on that record? Is gosh, is is Machine Gun on that record? Second song, side one. Yeah, yeah, I would probably say Machine Gun. I just yeah. think it's incredible. You're gonna get your money's worth. That song's like twelve minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty long. But I love like that's the thing. Like when I was was really young and like just kind of fooling around with my friends, like every band that I played played in was like a jam jam band. Yeah. I, I don't mean jam band, like, like string cheese incident style. I mean like that kind of blues style, like band of gypsy style, like just jamming on like, like a blues progression style band of gypsies kind of thing. What's interesting, the Southern rock thing and the sort of jam rock thing hit the tri-state area way harder than it did in Georgia. Like we were all in my high school bands, we were learning ACDC songs and Van Halen songs. Uh, we didn't really touch on the Almond Brothers and stuff because it was just too much effort, you know. Mm-hmm. But like I talked to musicians from New York, New Jersey, uh, and Connecticut, and they're all like, "Oh yeah, we learned Whip and Post, and we learned Jessica, and we learned." You know, yeah, uh, I got a lot of exposure to that stuff through my my middle brother my full brother who was in a number of bands when we were younger and i got a i got a lot of influence through seeing you know just like watching him grow up and and do his own thing and 
he was always in these bands that would cover this stuff, like Almond Brothers, do Almond Brothers covers. And like, it's not, dif- I mean, that's not easy stuff. No, it's no, it's not. No, it's not. Actually, so I, I maybe should have mentioned this earlier, but the 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 dude that my brother grew up with, his name is Dan Aid, and they were they were like best buddies growing up and had played in a bunch of bands together. He gave me some of my uh, very first guitar lessons, and he was a phenomenal guitar player. And it ended up uh, going to Berkeley for some time. Not sure if he, it was more than a year. Um, but today he is Nora Jones's, uh, guitar player. No, no kidding. Yeah. Well, I think Dave, Nora. I think Dave Demisi knew him too. He's mentioned him, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I guess yeah. that's a Gilford connection. Um, yeah, totally could be for sure. Oh, and one more, uh, a specific answer to that question. I would love to play bass for tower of power in the song squib cakes. That's uh-huh. hilarious. That's a side of you. I've never even known about. <laughs> If you haven't heard that song, I haven't. Oh man, it's unbelievable. It's it's like it, you can't listen to that song and like not start dancing. See, I didn't do Tower of Power. My brief foray into kind of modern jazz was Weather Report. I love. Oh yeah, Weather yeah. Report. Oh yeah, I had those records when I was Heavy here. Weather. Man, I must have played that record a, a million times. Yep. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a classic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last question. Um, if you could imagine a taxi that can go anywhere in space or time through the course of your life, um, and you got in the taxi and you said to the driver, hey, man, take me home. Where is home? I, I, when I was asked, when, I, when you gave me these questions in advance and I read that, I immediately thought of my solo trip to Iceland. It, it was just this really transcendent experience of just you know just having time to be with myself and my own thoughts and and uh travel around this barren country where there, you know there's there's 300,000 people in the entire country and two thirds of them are in Reykjavik so you know when you're driving around the countryside it's just it's just like untouched landscape and <laughs> I've heard it described as like driving across the surface of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's so young from a geological perspective, it's actually the youngest country in the world. And so you very much get that sense when you're driving around because it feels like the country itself, like the landscape is still forming. So one moment you're driving past like lava fields and then you're driving past like actual glaciers, like floating in the ocean. Wow. Um, so there was also this moment when I reached like the the most most northern point in in uh, Iceland in a city called Ekureyri, and I just kind of stumbled at in the evening on the northern lights. Uh, like you know, I, I was aware of that. That's like a thing there, but it's during like it has to be a certain temperature. It has to be a certain time of year. It's it's actually. Um, you know, not easy to just kind of stumble on it. And it was just like this giant painting, like this green painting and like these brush strokes that were happening in real time in the sky. And it was just like the most peaceful uh, moment. Um, it was, it was really surreal. It was unreal. Yeah. Um, but just that whole trip, it just felt, I just had this kind of feeling of, of home just in that quiet and solitude yeah. I dig it. Well, I really like that answer. Um, yeah. If people want to avail themselves of your services, how do they do it and what services uh, do you offer? Well, so I guess it depends on which services you're referring to. <laughs> well, I guess it, we can find you as a guitar player really easily because you're yeah. on all the social media and stuff. But uh, you, you've got the Mindful Nutrivore as your yeah. sort of mm-hmm. um, social media presence for your – you're consulting for diet and health uh, choices that people can make to maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So I work with clients from all over the country, um, all remotely over Zoom. And I, you know, I have the ability to have labs just like mailed right to your home. So it's, it's all like super easy now to work uh, as a, as a, a remote practitioner. And so people can find me at the mindful Um Also, if you just look up, 
Ryan Monahan on Google and add in uh, the letters FDN after that, which is my uh, clinical designation. Um, you can find me that way. Um, so I'm on Instagram, Twitter, all of that. And yeah, I also offer uh, free 20 minute consults. Um, if anyone was just interested in, in, uh, you know, kind of getting to know me and how I might be able to help with, with their health concerns and all that. Um, so that's how they can find me on that, on that health front. And that's, that's kind of my full-time gig, you know, uh, working remotely with clients to help them get to the root of their other main, uh, health concerns. Yeah. Um, also quick shout out, if you don't mind, um, just want to throw out there that right now our band Easter Island is releasing our second LP, which we've been working on for many years. And I got the pleasure of engineering and producing it. And we're, um, we are doing a fundraiser right now via Kickstarter to get that album out there in, into the world. So, um, any, uh, amount, no matter how small, um, goes a long way. Um, uh, even if that just means, uh, sharing the link, but we, yeah, we're definitely, um, you know, trying to get the word out there to, to be able to get this album out on vinyl. I'll put a link to the uh, Kickstarter video uh, in the show description for this show, but also it'll be on all my social media over the next few weeks. So if you need to, you should definitely check it out because the video is hilarious. The Pain Brothers <laughs> are hilarious, but it's also there's some snippets of the beautiful music you guys have made for this record, and it's really it's a, it's there's some unbelievably gorgeous songs on this record. Oh man, thank you so much, Patrick. I, I, I re- that means a lot coming from you. It's and well, you, it's you funny when I when I when I hear you say like I engineered and produced this record. Like you and I both know that that's like, it's the best work. It's so <laughs> good working with these songs. Probably probably why I uh, took six years too to get it done. Yeah, I guess I didn't ever mention through this whole process that the way that I met Easter Island was. Um, they were working in a studio where I was a house engineer and I came in and just like meshed with the material on a fundamental emotional level and started working on sculpting the sounds of the record and, and doing lots of guitar layering and, and it, it, it's been a fruitful work relationship, an amazing friend relationship. All of those guys, um, have been such a huge part of my life and I'm really excited for this new record for you guys. Well, you've been a big part of that history and story, and, and in shaping the the sound of the band, you know. So, you know, uh, the a lot of the production of this album was, uh, you know, a continuation of that same vocabulary, more or less. <laughs> it could simply be summed up as oceans of reverb. <laughs> yes, lots of oceans of reverb for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, because the material is is thoughtful and reverent enough. It felt to me like it needed a cathedral like around it and that was how i started to approach mixing everything i did for easter island there's no other way to mix easter island yeah except for oceans of reverb <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i mean this has been so great i'm so glad you were able to do this i could have you know gone on for hours and hours more there's, there's so much to talk about yeah it was really great um yeah get, if you're getting deep with some of this if you're a singer-songwriter and you want to continue this conversation, uh, Ryan and I are available as a rhythm section for a very reasonable fee. We would That's love right. to go on tour. That would be so fun. I, I would love any excuse to play with you again. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. I've had a lot of great times on stage with you, and I'm really grateful for our friendship. I'm grateful for it as well, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so episode 56 in the can. It's been a year since we started this thing. I think it just keeps getting better. Um, Hope you guys are hanging in there. Hope everybody's okay. Um, We're going to be locked in here for another week or so, and then I'm going to start driving around delivering fresh bread if I don't get this thing. So if you're in Athens, Georgia, find me on social media. Let's talk about getting some bread. Otherwise, keep an eye on the YouTube channel. I'm going to teach you how to make your own. Thanks to Jake Kreger. He's the guy totally responsible for the YouTube channel. He's the one editing this YouTube thing we're putting together right now. Like I send him video, I send him audio, and he just works his magic. And it comes out the other end perfect. And he's the one who put every single episode ever up already. He's a genius, a wonderful guy. He's sort of our producer, I guess, more so now than ever before. Uh, if the show is better now than it was the first time you heard it, that's mostly due to Jake's incredibly diligent work. Thank you, Jake. 
Thanks to Gene Wolfolk and the band The Powder Room. They provide all the music you hear on the episode, the intro music, the bumpers, this music you hear under my voice right now is all The Powder Room. They have a couple of great records on Bandcamp at thepowderroom.bandcamp.com. Gene also has a new band called Dream Tent with Erica from Motherfucker, not Erica the drummer from Motherfucker, but Erica the other Erica from Motherfucker. Um, I had a really great time playing music with her a couple of weeks ago. One of the greatest weeks of my entire life and really in, deeply in debt to them both. And I want to, you know, just thank both of them. Go check out Dream Tent, dreamtent.bandcamp.com. They've also got an Instagram page where they release every song in advance there. So go check them out on Instagram. In the meantime, if you're locked in like I am, you know, get out and get some sun on your face. Get a little vitamin D. Um, write down your feelings. Uh Talk to people. You know, you can still call people on a cell phone. You don't just have to text. And you can catch up, you know, like in real time. You can talk like you were standing next to each other, but you're at a safe distance because you're on the phone. It's amazing. You should try it. The first person to call me after we locked in, and I'd been here for a couple of days, was Sloan Spencer from the Southern Fried Rock, the podcast and music show in the town she lives in. And, man, I babbled her ear off like I had just hucked an entire eight ball. Um... Yeah, I just didn't know how to stop myself. It's like extrovert withdrawal up in here. <laughs> it was great to talk to her. I hope she got what she needed in that interview. But, boy, she got a lot of word salad. Man, I was excited to talk. Um, until we speak again, though, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Ask for help if you need it. Um, as soon as you can get out of here, go see some live music. Find some live music on the Internet to watch. I've been watching different bands streaming from different places. Uh, Support your favorite band. And remember, loud guitars save lives.